Hey everybody, we are walking through the book of James. September is our themed month on the book of James at wineskins.org. And I want to provide one video per chapter of the book of James, starting with James chapter 1. This video is going to be an introduction to James, who he was, his family, uh, his life, what we have about him in the book of Acts, and the letters of Paul, and also again in the book of James. So James is not James of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. The James who wrote the book of James in the New Testament is Jesus' half-brother. Jesus had brothers and sisters. We're going to read about that in just a moment from Mark chapter 6. Jesus, think about his family just for a moment. You know, Jesus' name, we have, we have Greek names, Hebrew names, and English names. We kind of have a, just a mess on our hands, right? So Jesus' name is Yeshua or Joshua. Jesus' mother was named Mary. We call her Mary, but her name in Hebrew would have been Miriam. Think about Moses' sister. Then Jesus' father is Joseph, or Yosef, who is Joseph of the Old Testament, the patriarchs there in the end of Genesis coming into Exodus. And then we have James, who is Jacobos, or Jacob, who is also a patriarch, Jesus' half-brother. And then we also have Jude, or Judah, or Judas. Jude and Judas are Greek names. His Hebrew name, Jesus' other half-brother, would have been Judah. He also had a half-brother named Simeon, and, and Mark 6 talks about some sisters. So Jesus is family, James's family, are thoroughly Jewish, observant Jewish people, just as we would expect that uh, Mary is found highly favored in the eyes of the Lord. They are observant Jewish people. They go to the temple to offer sacrifices. When Jesus is born, the sacrifice is not of the rich, but of the poor. They go to the, to the Jerusalem for times of festivals. These are observant Jewish people. Jesus is born into this family, and James is as well. And we're going to be reading from his letter here in just a moment. We run into this James in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 6, verse 3, where they, the, the crowd is asking, Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. We see him in Acts chapter 1, 14, when Mary and the 120 are gathered in the upper room uh, with the apostles waiting on the Holy Spirit. Another key place we find him is the transitional moment between both Jameses. Both Jameses are found in Acts chapter 12. Herod kills James the Greater, the James and John James, in uh, Acts chapter one, uh, 12, 1 and 2. And later on in that chapter in 12, 17, Peter talks about giving some information to James. You're like, reading that chapter, didn't James just die? Who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus' half-brother James, the author of the book of James. What we find in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 is that when Jesus resurrected, that he appeared to his brother James. And it, it seems as if James did not believe that Jesus was Messiah until after the resurrection. During Jesus' earthly ministry, before the crucifixion and resurrection, we see his brothers, his family, kind of doubting him, coming to him to kind of pull him away from the crowds, wondering what's going on with him. It seems as if James doesn't get this. And that, that would make an awful lot of sense to me. I'm the youngest in my family. If my older brother, kind of growing up, just had been told to me that he was the Son of God, he was going to be the Messiah and all this, I think it'd be a little hard to believe that. I think we have to cut James some slack in his unbelief until the resurrection of Jesus when Jesus purposefully appears to his half-brother. Of course, it seems as if Judah also comes around, or Judah, Judas, uh, his other brother who wrote the book of Jude in the New Testament was another one of Jesus' half-brothers. So if you think about it, Jesus' family actually makes up quite a bit of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, and Jude is a fair amount of the uh, the New Testament. So James shows up in Acts. He shows up in Acts 21 in a key role. as kind of now a new pillar of the church in Jerusalem. He's also found in in Galatians, when James sends people down to Galatia, where Peter runs into them and is not treating the Gentiles well, when the people from Jerusalem have come uh, there into Galatia, and Paul sees what's going on and rebukes Peter for his actions against the Gentiles of dividing against them. Again, we see him in Acts. Uh, again, again, we see him in 1 Corinthians 15:7, when the resurrected Jesus appears to people, specifically James, his half brother. James helps. Paul, whenever Paul gets to Jerusalem and Paul's needing some advice about what to do, James is the one who pulls Paul aside and tells him to pay for the, uh, the cleansing rites for some other people and to go down himself to do this to show that he's faithful to the law of Moses, which probably catches some of us off guard. What do you mean he's faithful to the law of Moses? I thought that was nailed to the cross in Colossians 2, but it, it's not. The law of Moses is not nailed to the cross. That's not at all what Colossians 2 is talking about. James the Greater in Acts 12 is killed in 44 AD. James, Jesus' brother, is killed in 62 when the Pharisees grab him and they throw him down from the temple and um, beat him with clubs to ensure that, that he has truly died. He dies a martyr, martyr 
for uh, Christianity. So now we turn to the book of James in James chapter 1. The first thing we want to understand is that this is a letter that James has written to the scattered 12 tribes when he's writing specifically to, to Christian Jews, it seems, or, or maybe the 12 tribes is symbolic of the whole church and that includes Gentiles as well. It's a little bit hard to know exactly what James means in James chapter 1 verse 1. James is very much to me like wisdom material. It, it's not like Proverbs in the sense of just boom, 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 all these kind of disconnected thoughts. It runs through some pretty serious and consistent themes throughout the book, but it, it, it reads in just such wisdom that James imparts to us. It's so practical. And he alludes to the teachings of his half-brother Jesus on several occasions, but he directly quotes um, Jesus at one point in time in James 5.12, quoting from Matthew chapter 5. So we're going to start in James chapter 1, verse 1 where it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. And now we talk, it's going to talk about sufferings and trials. Now, James would know this. He's seen this with his own eyes. He's probably been through it himself. But he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He knows about Christian persecution. He knows about those who come and persecute Paul in Jerusalem, who arrest him, who, who give Paul such a hard time where he ends up going to Rome to die. You know, he's talking about how as Christians in this world, there's going to be times when we suffer, but we have to look at the end goal of that suffering to understand what is being produced in us as we go through times of trial, hardship, and suffering, that it's ultimately the, the refining of our faith that we may become mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's that word teleos, which is the word the very furthest it can go, as complete as it can be, all the way to the furthest end. Think of like a telescope. The furthest end of how far you can see. That's what persevering through trials does to us. It takes us further down the Christian route to help us to mature more and more to be like Jesus, which is the end goal of our faith. Now in verse 5, he talks about the kind of wisdom that we need to ask for. And he talks about how whenever we ask God for this kind of wisdom, that God graciously gives us this, but we do not need to doubt. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously without finding fault, and it will be given to him. I have a mentor of mine who prays this for me regularly, that he prays that God will give me James chapter 1, verse 5, wisdom. And this is one of those verses that I view as a promise of God, that God promises us if we lack wisdom, we should ask him. And so it's one of those promises that I call upon God pretty regularly for. I say, God, please, I need wisdom. I'm a foolish person. I need your help. I need your insight. Please guide me and, and, and show me the right answer to this situation, to this circumstance, or this problem. And I just ask God, I call on him to make good on his promise in James chapter 1, verse 5, that if we ask God for wisdom, he will give generously. But then he says in verse 6, But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. So if we're lacking wisdom, there's no excuse to lack wisdom. We need to ask God to make us wise. And that's going to set us up for God to really make good on those promises. The next thing he talks about, he talks about a bit in verses 9 and following about the rich and the poor and about how we see ourselves in this world, where he says in verse 9, the brother in humble circumstances should take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. So and when Jesus was doing his ministry, this alludes a little bit to what Jesus said, that it's impossible. He talks about like the rich going into the kingdom of heaven, being like a camel going through the eye of the needle. And the, 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 the apostles say, like, that sounds impossible. But Jesus says what's impossible with man is possible with God. You know, most of us here in America are fairly rich people. In the context of the world, in the context of history, we need to really take faith seriously. We need to ask God for wisdom of how to deal with our resources, because sometimes we have more than we know what to do with. Most people in the world have not been in that circumstance. Most people in the world have gone through a lot more hardship, right? And that doesn't mean none of you have gone through hardship or financial difficulty. I'm just talking just on, on the average. We need to make sure we're seeing the world right side up and not upside down. It's those who are poor who truly understand their desperation and their need for God. Those who are rich, those who have insurance and who have, you know, all the things that they need financially and plans for the future and all this are the ones who very easily can quickly forget God and forget their need for God. And I think the thing he says next is connected to that in verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who loved him. 
When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, is drug away and enticed, and after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. That's exactly what James was saying is going to happen to the wealthy, is that it's so easy for those who have much means to be enticed by those things and to be taken away through their temptation and drug away, which ultimately leads to death, which is the scorching sun and all that that he was talking about that's going to come to the, the rich who he says will pass away like a wild flower, or then he later says will fade away even while he goes about his business. We do not, what did Jesus say? You cannot serve both God and money. You're going to love one and hate the other. You cannot serve two masters. So those of us who have a lot of possessions, those of us who have a lot of resources, a lot of money, need to really make sure that we are humble, that we are seeing ourselves from a humble position, completely relying on God in all things. This is not a condemnation of wealth in general. It's okay to have things, but it's about how we see our possessions. It's about how we see ourselves, and it's about how we see God in light of our possessions and of ourselves. If we think we are self-sufficient, it is very easy to quickly think that we have very little need for God, and that's when we get into our, uh, our, our biggest problems. I don't know if you know, but the average Christian gives away 2.5% of their income. And, and I think that's kind of a travesty, honestly, if I can kind of call that out for a minute. In the Old Testament, they were commanded to give 10%. Think about now all that we have in Christ, all that we have through the work of the Spirit, all that we have through the body of Christ, the community of faith, the church, all these promises, all these blessings, I mean, 10% should honestly be our start, right? Not 2%, not 3%. We need to challenge ourselves in that to really be people who, who give God our best because when you do that, it's going to put your possessions in proper perspective, right? So wealth and temptation do go together. It's not a new new paragraph. It's not a new topic in English. Uh, that our, our, our wealth, our possessions can stoke up within us evil desires that lead to us being scorched or blown away. And now in chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, he talks about righteousness and worldliness, and he just gets right to the point. He doesn't pull any punches in it. It's pretty devastating things that he says. He says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God's desire desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and all the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Don't be immoral. Don't go around just, just wallowing in the filth of the world. No. Spend time in the word. Listen to what God has instructed. Obey the teachings of Jesus. He says, do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Reminds me of the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the wise and foolish builders, the one who is wise, is the one who hears these words of mine, doesn't merely listen to them, but does what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently in the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, continues to look into that law, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, just like he talks about anger, now he talks about how we talk, we're talking, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. But what is the religion that God accepts is pure and faultless? To look after widows and orphans in their distress and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. Righteousness matters. Your choices matter. Obedience matters. How you live in the world truly matters. And we say, well, we're saved by grace, not by works so that no man should boast. So does it really matter how I live in this world? Do not engage in filth, but engage yourself in the word of God. And when you engage yourself in the word of God, make sure you're truly listening for what God's trying to tell you so that you can live a righteous life, living aligned with God's word and obedience to his commandments, because that's the kind of life that God has set before you. How many times have you woken up in the morning miserable over following the word of God? Absolutely pitiful, miserable for doing what God told you. No. How many times have you woken up absolutely miserable or wrecked because you didn't do what God said, but because you did not get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent? and didn't humbly accept the word of truth that has been planted within you. We need to be in the word. When you look at stats on Christians and non-Christians in behavior, there's almost no difference. And I'm going to tell you, 
if you looked at stats on how much Christians and non-Christians are in the Word of God, there's probably also very little difference because very few Christians are actually in the Word of God on a regular basis, taking it in and trying to live those principles out. Instead, we've kind of been bought this whole idea of a, of a kind of gospel that isn't really a gospel, which is how you live really doesn't matter because you're saved by grace anyway. So praise God for that, kind of do what you need to do. But Paul combats that in Romans 6 and other places, no, we, we need to strive for righteousness. We need to strive for obedience. And no, we're not going to do it perfect. We're going to mess it all up royally, but it should be our heart's desire to live aligned with our Heavenly Father. Now, why does he say that religion that is faultless is one that looks after widows and orphans? Because see, I would have thought that James should have said religion that is faultless is religion that imitates the five uh, five acts of worship and has proper governance and has the right perspective on the role of women and blah, 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 blah. No, he says, faultless, pure religion is looking after the widows and orphans. Why? Because they are in a completely humble circumstance. Widows and orphans have nothing to give you back. When you look after those who have nothing to give you back, you, you show that your motivation and your heart is pure and faultless, is blameless, because you are doing this for the least of these and they have nothing to give you. They cannot help your status. They cannot help your bank account. They cannot give you more security. They are just receiving, and you are giving out of your own goodness. You're giving out of your own purity of heart. So what kind of religion should be we be looking for? Talk about the kind of religion that God is looking for, we think, is a form of religion. It's an imitation of religion. It's a pattern of religion. It's a pattern of worship. No, it's not those things. It's to be a person who loves God, who loves neighbor, and who looks after those who are in, in compromised circumstances. This is what God is looking for. And to keep yourself from being polluted by the word, how do you, world, how do you keep yourself from being polluted by the world? You engage yourself in the word of God, listening for what God is telling you to live what you hear him say, to be aligned with God and to allow the Holy Spirit to work the transformation process in your life so that you will not engage yourself in the moral filth and evil that is so prevalent in the word, world. Okay? This is James chapter 1. It is incredibly challenging. It cuts us to the heart because how many of us have not been angry? How many of us have not had a hard time controlling our tongues? How many of us have not done well with our wealth, with our material possessions to steward them well for the kingdom, for kingdom growth to leverage them? How many of us are 2% Christians, 3% Christians, 4% Christians? We need to up our game. We need to get serious about sacrifice. We need to get in intentionally focused on helping the people who need the most help and not just helping people who can help me, right? And so I, I just hope and pray that these words from James 1 challenge you to the core and understand that maybe sometimes the position we think is a high position is a low position, and we need to actually be seeking out low position to see ourselves from a humble perspective, to understand our profound need for God in all things. And then we pray for wisdom. And I want to end with a prayer for wisdom. God, we call upon you in this video to give us the kind of wisdom that you've told us you will give to those who ask and do not doubt from James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. We call upon you to make good on those promises and God, just to, to help us to navigate the decisions that you have put before us, that we will do so with clarity and boldness. And God, where we do not have clarity, we pray for patience that we can wait upon you to give us the answer to our prayers. We ask you for direction, when we ask you for guidance, when we ask you for help in making godly decisions. God, if we do not have a direct straight path forward, that you will give us the patience to wait on a word from you. God, thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for answering it. We do not doubt that you will and can do these things. And so God, thank you for granting our prayer. We, we tell you that. We thank you for that in advance of you even doing it. God, we love you, we appreciate you, we thank you in all things and help us to firmly plant ourselves in the word and to be obedient to what we hear so that we will not be foolish people. It's the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Thanks for watching. Tell a friend, God bless you. See you next time. And I appreciate you watching.